Hello there, this is Aaron Shore, and you are listening to Movie Phone Call, a podcast show recorded on my iPhone. Today we'll be discussing Lars Van Trier's Melancholia, and we'll be doing a top five countdown to my favorite unconventional Christmas slash holiday films. But let us begin with Melancholia. We're all alone. Life is only on Earth. And not for long. Justine and Mike. Never seen you look so happy. Enjoy it while it lasts. I myself hate marriages. She ruined my wedding. I will not look at her. Is everybody in your family still grieving mad? I went in with this movie with an open mind, mainly because Lars Van Trier is a very unpredictable director. Recently I had a chance to watch Antichrist on Netflix, and I had mixed emotions about that movie. It was, I mean, lack of a better word, dark, but then again, Van Trier's work is extremely dark, although I did like uh, Europa a lot. But... I didn't know what I was going to be expecting with Melancholia. I uh, saw from the trailer that what you just heard that the movie is mainly about the end of the world. And Von Trier even said in interviews that uh, he was intending to make a beautiful end of the world picture. And when we associate with end of the world movies, it's fair to say they belong more in the blockbuster realm. You know, the Michael Bay type movies. So it's, you know, interesting where an art house director who has, you know, a history of dark themes and heavy, heavy uh, material in his movies decides to do an end of the world movie. And you wonder how is he going to accomplish that? Well, I have to say, with what the movie throws at us, I was quite content with uh, Melancholia. Um, The movie is about two sisters, uh, Justine, played by... Kristen Dunst, who I'm sure is probably going to get an Oscar nomination out of this movie. And then the other part of the film focuses on Justine's sister Claire, played by uh, Charlotte Gingsborg, who uh, was recently in Antichrist. The movie is broken up into two parts, and really what the movie is about is that it focuses on um, the theme of fear. And it's quite interesting how the same fear is sort of connected in the two different ways, yet they're both connected in one similar notion. Uh, in part one, which is simply called Justine, uh, focuses on the night of her wedding. She is recently marrying her her love uh, named Michael, played by Alexander Skarsgård. Girls might know him from True Blood. Can we, can we talk somewhere? Of course. Hey, right. uh, sit down, please. I wasn't going to give you this until tomorrow. I found our plot of land. They're called empire apples. And they're bright red and very sweet. But with a perfect tartness. In part one, we focus on Justine and the night uh, after her wedding and the wedding party, which is being taken place at her sister and brother-in-law's mansion in the countryside. She is not content with her happiness. She may fake it, but she knows that she's not happy, and people in her family uh, have seen the, the signs in the past that she suffered from depression. Now, that's what the movie is, you know. Um, showing us. Uh, Her mother in the film is very um, cold and calculated. She is played by veteran British actress Charlotte Rampling, who was recently in last year's uh, Never Let Me Go. She, her character was really odd because she's there at the wedding and you know a mother is supposed to be there and support their daughter in their wedding and she bluntly gives a toast saying that she doesn't believe in weddings she doesn't believe in marriage and she hopes that her daughter uh enjoys it while it lasts kind of a you know um, a parental foreshadowing of the end if you will so i kind of found that really you know 
it, it felt odd. But in a way, it, it's that, you know, dynamic that uh, Von Trier likes to play with his characters. They're very, you know, um, cold-hearted sometimes, and sometimes very uh, conflicted people. And there are a lot of conflicted people in this movie. Justine, I mean, she is, without a doubt, um, a very <laughs> messed up young woman. She uh, takes a break from her wedding, goes upstairs, and takes off her wedding dress and takes a bath, and everyone is wondering where in the hell is she? They're waiting to cut the cake, and she's just wasting time. Justine, it's John. We're ready to cut the cake, sweetheart. Please come downstairs as soon as you can, okay? Everybody, thank you for being so patient. We're just having a little issue with the wedding dress. She'll be right down. Those bitches have locked themselves in their bedrooms, and now they're taking a bath. Is everybody in your family stark raving mad? It seems that Justine is afraid of happiness. Because, you know, it, it might not last long. Her mother even said so in her toast that enjoy it while it lasts. Well, how long will it last? And that's what I was sort of getting from her. You know, she was scared. And, you know, she just doesn't know how to handle the newfound happiness. And it was kind of interesting how this part one sort of shows her slowly decline. It opens with her... Um, you know, being with her husband in the back of the limo, and they're trying to get through the driveway because it's all very narrow, and, you know, they're both directing each other, trying to get on, up to the, the mansion, and they're very lovey-dovey, and they're kissing each other, and they're, you know, they're being what, you know, a newlywed couple should be. And then you start seeing these, uh, these slow signs of, huh, maybe they didn't make the right choices, uh, or maybe she didn't make the right choice. And when he finally takes her upstairs, uh, you know, holding her in the um, groom's arms, you know, that iconic shot of a groom holding his bride and taking her into the hotel room, and he slowly is undressing, and she is reluctant to undress, and she holds back when he's trying to show some kind of physical emotion with her. Part two is called Claire, um, the sister of Justine. Uh, it opens up basically maybe within maybe months after the wedding. Um, Justine is no longer with her um, husband, Michael. She's now uh, gone through some hectic uh, times. So when Justine comes to live with her sister Claire, Claire's uh, notions of fear reside from the planet Melancholia. Uh, it's in the news that this planet is slowly moving towards Earth, and some are saying that's just going to pass by Earth, and we're going to see it right above our heads, and then it's just, it's never going to come back again. And others believe that it's going to perform uh, what in the movie says the dance of death, where it does pass over Earth and then does a slingshot backwards, and then will impact into the planet. And well, subsequently, that's what happens. Uh, spoilers, but the movie is about the end of the world. And, you know, Justine is sort of, you know, she doesn't care about this type of fear. She, you know, if the world ends, so be it. You know, she would rather have that end than end, uh, a happiness that she was afraid of ruining. The earth is evil. We don't need to grieve for it. What? Nobody will miss it. But where would Leo grow up? All I know is life on Earth is evil. Um, the first ten minutes of the movie is the setup to the end of the world. And it's done in a very immaculate way. Uh, the cinematographer for this movie, his name is Manuel Alberto Carlo. This movie had some of the best cinematography I have seen this year. And like I said, the opening of the movie is the... Um, the movie opens with the prologue, I guess, if you will, of the story, the end. 
and everything is done in high speed photography so it's all in very in slow motion extremely slow and it shows claire with her son running uh, away uh, from all the you know natural disaster that's going around you see birds slowly falling down and you see uh hail slowly uh falling down i mean it's so it's it's so beautifully scary and in a way the cinematography helps this movie uh accomplish that beautiful end of the world look there's one scene in particular that just it you know it's been stuck in my brain ever since i saw the movie and there's this beautiful setup where uh, Justine is going to run out into the night, and Claire is following her, and it goes out into the backyard of the mansion, and there in the, in the night sky is the moon shining this, like, gold light, and then to the right of the screen, and to the right, next to the moon, is the planet Melancholia, and it's glowing blue and shining a blue light. So you got these two different colors con both contrasting each other, and they're, it's so... I couldn't fathom how they lit that scene and pulled off that shot. I was so taken back. It, more than any of the other visuals in this movie, it was it was something... I just wanted to know the secret. How did they set up that shot? It, it was unbelievable. Before I conclude my review, um, for all the beautiful shots that you, this movie presents to us and some of the interesting themes it plays with. I will say, what, what kind of kept me back from giving this like a really great review was that the movie, it tended, it does drag. Mainly because in part one, it's so slow moving and it just, it, sh it gradually shows the decline of uh, Justine's happiness. And I think there could have been a lot of things cut out of that, um, that's, you know, that part. Um, there's this little subplot about, you know, the job that she works for, um, and she works for, um, a, f a fashion company, and she's trying to come up with a tagline for, um, an ad, and it just, it, it leads to some really odd choices, um, with her character and a couple of her work people, and one of the work people is played by Alexander Skarsgård's father, Stellan Skarsgård, who is the best man, but also the bride's boss at the company she works for. And, you know, the movie, I guess, maybe had a little too much exposition. But then again, I guess Von Trier is known for that. 